So my talk is about seeing into the future as a bionic eye possible. Um, about 20 years ago, I was recruited by a company that was trying to build a bionic eye in order to restore vision to the blind. About 17 million people are blind globally worldwide. And so there's a lot of interest in trying to see if we could find a way to restore sight to those people. And so I was sort of excited. I was about 30, and I joined the company. And that's kind of set the path for a lot of my career since then. So most of these devices, there are a lot of technologies out there to restore sight. I'm just going to talk, kind of do a very broad overview. But most of them are built on the same basic principle. What you have, for example, if you take a retinal electronic implant, which is the implant that I was hired to work on, you have someone who's blind. You have a camera that looks at the world, takes a movie of the world. That movie of the world is sent to a small computer that gets smaller and smaller every day. And that computer is going to send signals to electro um, electrodes on the back of the eye. Because what the eye has is it has a layer of cells called the photoreceptors that take light and turn it into electrical signals. And then it has a set of cells, it's a bit like a sandwich, that process that signal further and then send that signal to the brain. And so the idea is that even when those photoreceptors are dead, if you put electrodes on the remaining cells and you chart, use electrical signals to get firing in those remaining cells, you can send an electrical signal to the brain. That's the electrodes on the retina, it's a view of the back of the retina, and you can send a signal to the brain that the person will be able to see. That was the technology that was people were working on at the time. But there are other technologies out there that are new and are really exciting. One of the most exciting is retinal optogenetics. It starts with the same thing. You start with a camera looking at the world. But this time, instead of sending, you send the signal to the small computer, but then you send it to a laser array. And now I know your mother has always said, don't play with cat toys because you will be blind. But it is not, in fact, true that cat, we have cat toys that can blind people because obviously they wouldn't be sold to children if they were. So lasers are simply just wavelength light that is of a single wavelength. So what we do is we send a light of a single wavelength at a pretty high intensity. And that light goes to the back of the retina. And those remaining cells of the retina, the ones that haven't kind of died in the, in the disease, they've been implanted with a protein that makes those cells light sensitive. That protein essentially attaches to the membranes of the cells and turns these cells that originally didn't respond to light into light sensitive cells. Those light sensitive cells, they get hit by the laser, they fire, they send signal, they hit the laser, they send signals to the brain, hopefully the person sees. Now these technologies are still in the very early stages, but they're really exciting. But I'm not gonna talk about those either. What I'm gonna talk about is cortical implants. Same principle again, you start with a camera, the camera looks at the world, goes to computer, but this time the signal is sent to the back of the head. Because the back of the head is where the parts of your brain that do vision is. That's why if you fall backwards, you see stars. So the signals go to the back of the head where there's electrode array. And that electrode array, that's an um, x-ray of somebody implanted with cortical electrodes. And there you have the electrodes. And again, the idea is the electrodes fire, they send signals, the signals go, to, and then you see something. So that x-ray I'm showing there is from one of the first cortical implants. And this technology has actually been around for quite a long time. This was 1968. You wouldn't have thought. And that's the guy who the electrodes were implanted in. At the time, right, you know when you put your watch and it charges overnight, except the cat knocks your watch off the little thing and it doesn't charge overnight, so you don't have the wireless, you know, wireless charging? stations. Well, they didn't have them then. So this guy actually has wires going into his head. We don't do that anymore. We now use wireless links. Um, and this is a picture of him wired up to the computer. As you can see, the computers then were, and the amplifiers were pretty um, 1960s style, retro, except it wasn't retro then. And when you stimulated these electrodes and you asked the patient to report what he saw, he saw little dots of lights in various locations. Okay. After that, for various complicated reasons, mostly to do with morality and ethics, we didn't do anything on this for quite a long time. But more recently, there's been an re increased new interest in trying to get this to work. One of the first kind of waves of this new interest was in 2019, when the company Second Sight implanted something they called the Orion 2019. Since then, there's another group, Fernandez in Spain, has something called CourtViz. But the one I'm going to focus on here is Neuralink 2025. Neuralink, which is planning to implant patients this year. 
Now, Neuralink is a company run by somebody called Elon Musk, who some of you may have heard of, maybe, maybe, maybe not. And this is the device. It's essentially, it's a small chip. It's the chip there, you can see it's about the size of a thumb. And then you can see those wire, whoa, 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 wires coming out of it. Those are very thin wires. They're about the thickness of a hair. And that, that black thing at the bottom is just to stop them tangling up, okay? And what each of these wires is essentially, you can see that string of beads there. Each of those is an electrode. And the idea is you just take in kind of a needle and kind of push them into the back of the cortex, kind of through the layers of the cortex. And then each of those little beads becomes an electrode. Okay, so you can get kind of into these folds of the cortex, which is quite a difficult thing to do otherwise. Now, as you can imagine, pushing these little hairs of electrodes through cortex is a tricky job. And they decided not to trust a surgeon to do it, so they've built an unbelievably expensive robot. I think it's half a billion dollars, but don't quote me on that. And that is what they're using to use the surgery. So this is amazing technology, right? This is quite incredible. So the idea here is that if they can put in enough small, tiny electrodes, they're going to get really good vision. And my husband likes to call this the scoreboard model based on like when you watch a soccer game and the score is put up on that screen which has the dots that make the letters. That's why it's called the scoreboard model. And the idea behind the scoreboard model is if you only have a certain number of electrodes, like 100 electrodes, you're not going to have very good vision. But if you increase the number of electrodes, the vision will improve. Increase it again, the vision will get better. And finally, you'll have perfect vision or superhuman vision. What I'm going to argue is that this is based on a fallacy. And I'm going to use, for the metaphor of my fallacy, the beginnings of aviation. Because that's a similar kind of challenge, right? Man flying, that's kind of amazing. Man restoring vision, it's kind of their equally scale of challenge, right? So let's think about the beginning of aviation. What I'm going to argue, sorry, is that electrode sizes and dense electrode spacing is not sufficient to produce high resolution vision. And these engineering approaches are wrong. So let's think about this in terms of aviation. The first people who did aviation, well, they thought, well, I want man to fly. What can fly? Birds can fly. I'm going to turn man into a bird. And that's what they built. And I'm sure you can guess that didn't work. They kind of went off a cliff slightly more slowly than they would have otherwise. So this guy, or some other guy, decided, no, the problem is definitely we don't have enough wingspan. And I need to build more wingspan. So they built a device with more wingspan. And as it may not surprise you, that didn't work either. So then they kind of really kicked it up a notch. And I like to call this the Neuralink of aviation, because they have more surface area than anybody else. This one doesn't work either. There's a hilarious video of this collapsing. In, it doesn't even get off the ground. So if we think about the most sophisticated airplane in the world right now, it has no wingspan. It barely has wings. Those little stumps are what it flies with. And so the fundamental idea that high surface area was the solution to flight was wrong. And what I'm arguing is the fundamental idea that having lots of tiny little electrodes is the solution to good prosthetic vision is equally wrong. And so how do you get, how do you find something better? And what I'd argue is, let's again, let's look at aviation. We don't build airplanes right now using make it, break it till you make it. I think that's actually the Silicon Valley expression, break it till you make it, right? That's how they were building airplanes. Didn't go so well. The way we build airplanes now is we build them on computers. We build them in silico. We know how they're going to fly and what they're going to fly like before we ever screw a bolt. And that's what I do. So what I do is I build computer models that take the input from the visual world, and I try to simulate what's happening both in the electronics of the implant and in the brain, and I try to predict what patients are going to see. And the idea is if I can do this, we can build better implants, and we can have more realistic expectations about what we're going to build. So I'm going to go to talk a little bit about when I say I simulate the brain, it's really pretty simple. So a single neuron in cortex 
doesn't represent a spot of light. It doesn't represent a pixel. Instead, a single neuron and cortex is optimally excited by a pretty complex pattern in the visual world. And each neuron has its own individual complex pattern that it responds to. And that pattern, so individual neurons don't respond to dots or spots. They respond to stuff. And that's referred to as the idea of a receptive field, the thing the neuron is receptive to. And so if you electrically stimulate a single neuron, the percept isn't going to be a dot. The percept is going to be the thing that that neuron represents. It might be something like this. It might be something like this. It might be something like that. You just don't know. And there's no way, by looking at that neuron, for working out what that is. And so if you look at a star in the sky, it's going to cause a response in every single neuron that has a receptive field that overlaps with that point of light, that star in the sky. And it's going to elicit a response in hundreds or thousands of neurons. But again, there's no way of knowing what those neurons represent. And without accurate knowledge of those receptive fields, you're not going to see a star. You'll see something, and it will be a spot. But it isn't a perfect star, even if you stimulate. Even if you could separately stimulate every neuron, there's another huge problem. You have to know what those neurons represent. And so this is the simulation, and this is what the simulation tells us. And the data really bears out this idea. So this is an example from a different array by Phil Troik. And you can see the array there. That array is about, uh, about the size of a sequin, a little bit bigger than a sequin. And what you can see is we're looking at what you get when you stimulate three different electrodes on that array. And what you're not seeing, that's those simulations up there, is what our model predicts you're going to see. And our model predicts that each electrode stimu stimulates about three or four cells. And so you get a complex pattern that's a combination of those three or four cells. And so those are the predictions we made for the model. And we made those predictions before they ever implanted a patient. And when they found in those patients, they were hoping to see these nice little dots. And instead, what the patients said is they saw amoebas or crosses. Phosphines are roughly half a degree in size that contain dark regions. And I think you'd argue, if you were a blind person describing this model simulation, you'd probably say something like that. Since then, we've been working out with other groups in Spain, especially Fernandez Group in Spain. And our model can predict individual percepts from these patients, which is really exciting. The other thing we can do with this model, ah, there we go, is we can look at what would you get if you got more and more electrodes? If, do you get better vision? And what you can see is there's an increase as you go from 6,000 to 22,000 electrodes. But after that, things don't really get that much better. It really is kind of, it, you're still not getting super resolution vision. And you might say, well, that's really depressing. But I will point out that this kind of vision would be life changing for many, many millions of people. This is a realistic estimate, but it's not a depressing one. OK? It's still something, if we can achieve this, we've achieved something we can be really proud of. So to conclude, we're at a really exciting time for site recovery technologies, right? We've got real interest in it. We've got money in it. We've got scientists working on it. It's a really exciting time. But I would argue we're still, we're still at the stage where we were, where Otto Liesenthal was jumping off with this, his crazy de Birdman device. We're still not there. The way we're going to get a better device is by following avionics, by modeling what we're going to see and what we expect to see so that when we build something, we know how it's going to perform. And that will be the future of site recovery technologies. Thank you very much.